let me start by saying that I'm speaking to you as a designer and architect. Uh, I have had, uh, I have practiced uh, design from graphic design, full uh, product design, architecture, and city planning for 55 years. I closed my office four years ago. So my, uh, all my writings and lectures arise from uh, mainly personal experiences. I, I'm not a scientist, I'm uh, an observer. And uh, coming back to what uh, Harry said, uh, the word uh, theorein in a Greek language originally meant uh, to be intensely looking at. It did not mean uh, speculating. Uh, so in that sense, I am a theorist, but uh, I otherwise uh, feel uh, rather uneasy when I'm introduced as a theoretician because sincerely I could not say what the theory of architecture could be uh, and what its uh, role could be. Uh, maybe uh, in, in the end uh, I could explain why I have this uh, attitude. I have entitled my lecture Embodied Space in Art and Architecture, Peripheral Vision, Vagueness and Diffuse Thinking. I decided not to use uh, images, although I had the images selected. Le Corbusier's credo, architecture is the mastery, correct mm -hmm. and magnificent play brought together, a uh, play of masses brought together <coughs> in light was also my understanding of the essence of architecture as a young architect. During the past three decades, however, I have become increasingly doubtful of the hegemonic role of vision in uh, my craft. Today, after more than half a century of uh, architectural practice and thinking, I dare to suggest that architecture is not primarily a visual art, art form. It is a haptic art form of the body as an integrated entity. And already Walter Benjamin, if you, you might remember, named architecture and cinema as tactile arts. If I were asked to name one sensory modality as the center of our experience of space and place, I would answer without any hesitation, the, body, the bodily sense of self. The sense of self, by the way, is one of the 12 Steinerian senses. Besides, architecture is always a relational <coughs> and mediating experience. It is about our relations and interactions with the world. As Maurice Merleau-Ponty states, we come not to see the work of art, but the world according to the work. I would like to uh, explain the philosopher's expression quote, in accordance with the work, unquote. Artistic works sensitize and articulate the boundary between ourselves and the world. In the word, words of Salman Pushti, the writer, quote, literature is made at the boundary between self and the world, and during the creative act, this boundary softens, turns penetrable, and allows the world to flow into the artist and the artist to flow into the world." Unquote. This description also applies in architecture, both in its phase of uh, design as well as the experience of the work. A true work of art of any kind enables us to confront our life situation and the world 
with the extraordinary <coughs> sensitivity of the artist. We can experience through the unique senses of Michelangelo, Paul Cezanne, and Rainer Maria Rilke, if we want to. The work opens up structures, articulates and sensitizes the world for our perceptions and consciousness. And this is the great gift of art. The next chapter type on a title is the hegemony of focused vision. Vision is usually dealt with in isolation from the other senses. And we continue to speak of visual arts, and architecture is normally included in this category. And visual perception itself continues to be commonly understood as a mode of optic projection on the basis of the metaphor of the camera lens. Yet, the complex and essentially fragmented process of vision is closer to an outreaching creative search and processes of interpretation and giving or seeking meaning than any kind of me mechanical projection. In real life situations, vision is always in interaction with the other senses. The psychological tests that have isolated or fixated vision have surely misguided our understanding of vision in real life. As Maurice Merleau-Ponty argues, quote, my perception is not a sum of visual, tactile, and audible givens. I perceive in a total way with my whole being. I grasp a unique structure of the thing, a unique way of being which speaks to all my senses at once. End of quote. But how do we perceive, quote, in a total way? The next chapter heading, <coughs> Touching the World. All the senses are specializations of originary skin tissue and ways of touching the world in concert with memory and imagination. Merleau-Ponty describes poetically the impact of Paul Cezanne's paintings. Quote, they make visible how the world touches us, unquote. In my view, this is exactly the fundamental task of architecture, to provide us with our existential foothold and niche in the world, to mediate our relationship with the limit, limitless natural space and time and to give us horizons and frames of perception uh, and uh, understanding. All the senses are ways of um, placing us in the world, and they give rise to the sense of existen existence, self, and the real, in my view. Architecture needs to strengthen our sense of the real instead of inhabiting us in fabricated illusions or dreams as today's fashionable architecture seems to assume. Sense experiences are internalized and embodied into a polyphonic and synthetic sense of the self in the world this is the, quote, total way, unquote, that Merleau-Ponty refers to. This embodied existential sense is the true ground of experiencing space and place, as well as understanding the world. This, quote, understanding, unquote, is not an intellectual uh, grasp but a full interchange between the world and the self, the fusion in the flesh of the world, to use another uh, essential, remarkable notion of Merleau-Ponty. 
Even our creative capacity does not arise from vision, but from our existential experience and consciousness in order to have a deep influence on us the poetic image in all art forms has to be internalized into an embodied image. Rainer Maria Rilke gives a stunning description of the gradual <coughs> emergence of a line of verse. Quote, For verses are not, as people imagine, simply feelings. They are experiences. For the sake of a single verse, one must see many cities, men and things. One must know the animals. One must feel how the birds fly and know the gesture with which the little flowers open in the morning." Unquote. He continues his list of uh, necessary experiences for an entire page. But uh, then he confesses that even all of this together is not sufficient to create a line of verse. One has to forget all of this and have the patience to wait for the distilled return of these experiences. Only after all our life experiences have turned into our blood within us, quote, not till then can it happen that in a most rare hour the first word of a verse arises in the midst and goes forth from them." Unquote. Another poet, the Im Im imagist poet Ezra Pound, also writes equally forcefully about the specific quality of the poetized image. Quote, An image is that which presents an intellectual and emotional complex in an instant of time. Only such an image, such a poetry, could give us the sense of sudden liberation, that sense of freedom from time limits and space limits, that sense of sudden growth which we experience in the presence of the greatest works of art. Next chapter, the dynamics of vision. We are still taught to believe that we see the world in relative focus and the world is more or less as we see it. Only recently there have been voices that question the received understanding of vision, such as the book Vision, the Grand Illusion, edited by philosopher Alva Noe. Dynamic vagueness and absence of focus are the conditions of our normal system of visual perception, although we do not usually acknowledge it. Most of us, having normal eyesight, tend to believe that we see the world around us in relative focus at all times. The fact is, which you scholars know of course, is that we see constantly a blur and only a tiny fraction of the visual field at any time, about one thousandth of the entire field of vision is seen distinctly. <coughs> the field outside of this minute focused center of vision turns increasingly vague and hazy towards the periphery of the visual field. Focal vision covers about four degrees of the approximate total angle of 180 degrees, which means uh, one, one forty-fifth of the entire field. Besides, we see only the focused area in color, the rest is seen without color. However, we are unaware of this fundamental lack of accuracy 
because we constantly scan the field of vision with movements of the eye that for the most part remain unconscious and unnoticed to bring a part of the blurred periphery at a time into the narrow beam of vision that is brought to a focal pinpoint at the foveya. The focused vision is a thousandth of the entire field and 999 thousandths are always out of focus and part of the unfocused, soft-edged periphery. Experiments have revealed that surprise, the surprising fact that the unconscious eye movements are not merely aids to, the, to clear vision, but an absolute prerequisite of vision altogether. When the subject's gaze is experimentally forced to remain completely fixed on a stationary object, the image of the object disintegrates and keeps disappearing and re reappearing again in distorted shapes and fragments. Quote, static vision does not exist. There is no seeing without exploring, unquote, argues the Hungarian-born writer and scholar Arthur Köstler. Köstler suggests a cautious analogy between visual scanning and mental scanning. Quote, between the blurred peripheral vision outside the focal beam and the hazy, half-formed notions which accompany thinking on the fringes of consciousness. Quote, if one uh, attempts to hold fast to a mental image or concept, to hold it immobile and isolated in the focus of awareness, it will disintegrate, like the static visual image on the forehead. Thinking is never sharp, neat, linear process. End of quote. Köstler argues and distinguishes focal awareness from peripheral awareness. Even pronouncing a familiar word repeatedly makes it gradually dissolve and lose its meaning. William James made a similar remark on the fundamental dyna dynamism and historicity of thought. Quote, every definite image in the mind is steeped and died in the free water that flows around it. With it goes the sense of its relations, near and remote, the dying echo of whence it came to us, the dawning sense of whither it is to lead. The significance, the value of the image is all in this halo or penumbra that surrounds and escorts it. End of Williams. Uh, end of uh, James' quote. This suggests that our visually acquired image of the world is not a picture at all, but a continuous plastic and embodied construct that keeps integrating singular percepts through memory into the continuum of the flesh of the world. Visual percepts are integrated and memorized as embodied haptic entities rather than uh, rather than singular retinal pictures, snapshots, as it were. I, must, I myself must have lived in or stayed in more than 1,000 hotel rooms around the world, but I can enter each one of them and recall their configuration, materiality, and illumination as a body memory. The image arises from my body in the same way as Marcel Proust describes the, the protagonist recovering 
his memory after having fallen asleep for a moment at daytime through, quote, the composite memory of his ribs, knees, and shoulder blades, unquote. Finally, the presence, permanence, and continuity of our experiential world is established and maintained as an embodied and haptic understanding of the flesh of the world, which we share with our own bodily existence. The sense of self in the world could, in fact, be regarded as one of our sensory modes, and indeed the Steinerian philosophy theorizes 12 senses, one of which is the ego sense of the sense of self. This sense is crucial for our experience of the world and ourselves as a temporal continuum and an experience of relative constancy. I wish to argue that it is this sense of self in the world which is the most essential sense in architecture. Recent neurological studies have revealed another surprising dynamic characteristic of vision. Experiments that measure the relative duration that it takes to perceive color, form, and motion show that these three attributes of a visual percept are not perceived at the same time. Color is per perceived 20 to 30 milliseconds before form, which is perceived another 20 to 30 milliseconds before motion. So the time difference between the perception of color and motion thus totals 40 to 30, uh, 60 milliseconds. This suggests that these different perceptual systems, color, shape, and movement, are functionally specialized. Isn't it a bit shocking to realize that there is no singular visual image at all, but a sequence of processes? The manner in which certain artists separate color, form, and movement uh, has thus uh, a motivation in the fact faculties of our perceptual mechanism. In the intriguing book, Proust was a neuroscientist, Jonah Lehrer suggests that great artists such as Walt Whitman, Marcel Proust, Paul Cezanne, Igor Stravinsky, and Gertrude Stein anticipated certain neurological findings of today in their art decades or even a full century earlier. Next chapter heading Gestalt, free perception, and unconscious vision. Gestalt theory established the view of the articulating or Gestalt tendency of surface perception that selects and organizes images and their elements in accordance with distinct formal properties such as simplicity, similarity, compactness, coherence, and closer, for, for example. At the same time, the theory neglects the inarticulate form elements which are not part of the Gestalt. Yet already Sigmund Freud <coughs> observed that form experiences arising from lower levels of the mind, such as dream visions, tend to appear inarticulate and chaotic for the conscious mind, and that they are thus difficult or impossible to grasp consciously. However, exactly this undefined, undefined formless, and involuntary interacting medley of images associations and recollections seems to be the necessary mental ground for creative insight and discovery, as well as for the richness and plasticity of artistic expression. The shock of life or the sensation of breathing that Konstantin Prampusi considers prerequisites for a profound work of art. 
I'm here referring to a stunning sentence by Brancusi, where, uh, in which he says or writes, a work of art must uh, evoke immediately, in an instant, the shock of life, the sensation of breathing. That's the finest sentence I can tell my students. Anton Ehrenzweig, the Austrian-born pianist, singer, and a psychoanalytic interpreter of artistic vision and hearing, clearly distinguishes surface vision from unconscious vision. Quote, while surface vision is disjunctive, low level, uh, which means unconscious primary level vision is conjunctive and serial. The su superior efficiency of unconscious vision in scanning the total field has been confirmed by experiments in subliminal vision, such as our capacity to grasp split-second tachistoscopic exposures of uh, consciously <coughs> invisible subliminal images. This capacity is shrewdly deployed today in methods of subconscious advertising and other forms of mental condition. In his two books, the first one entitled the Psychoanalysis of Artistic Vision and Hearing, An Introduction to a Theory of Unconscious Perception of 1953, and the latter one, The Hidden Order of Art, uh, published in 1970, Ehrenzweig establishes convincingly the priority of unconscious perception and thinking in the creative process. He even suggests that any act of creativeness in the human mind involves the temporary paralysis of the mental surface functions and a longer or shorter reactivation of more archaic and less differentiated functions. Instead of merely adding details to the multiplicity of artistic form, the inarticulate ingredients of the artistic language may well be its very origin and essence. Erend Zweig argues for the central importance of gestalt free vision, which means modes of vision that take place outside to get gestalt principles, and assumes that the capability of the superimposed perception of simultaneous and juxtaposed images implies that normal focused perception has to be suppressed in accordance with Henri Bergson's view he argues that quote all creative thinking begins with a state of fluid vision comparable to intuition from which later rational ideas emerge end of quote Ehrenzweig concludes that all artistic perception possesses a gestalt-free element. And this gestalt-free uh, diffuse vision is the artistic way of seeing the world. In his studies in the psychology of mathematical thought, the French mathematician Jacques Ramar proposes that even in mathematics, the ultimate decision must be left to the unconsciousness as a clear visualization of the problem is usually impossible. Adamar, like Henri Poincaré, another famous mathematician before him, states categorically that it is mandatory, mandatory to, quote, cloud one's consciousness in order to make the right decision, unquote. Adamar makes an interesting further suggestion Greek geometry lost its creative impetus in Hellenistic times because of too precise visualization. 
it produced generations of clever computers and geometers, but no true geometricians. Development in geometric theory stopped altogether. Are we today falling into the same trap with our use of computers? I would say yes. In my writings, I have made the worried suggestion that the absolute metric precision of computerized design, both in architectural education and practice, has a negative impact on the innately shapeless and measureless flow of images and ideas in the creative imagination. <clears throat> Precision and finite, finiteness of imagery too early in the design process are simply negative. Thinking advances through undefined uh, vagueness rather than precision and certainty. The inherent thickness of a charcoal or 6B pencil line uh, in the process of sketching naturally provide this space of dynamic indeterminacy and interpretation. Clarity and precision are also essential, but they have their role and significance later in the process. Next chapter is entitled The Lived World and Unfocused Vision. Outside the specific realm of artistic perception and creativity, an essential prerequisite for the everyday experience of enveloping spatiality, interiority and hapticity of the world is the deliberate, deliberate suppression of sharp focused vision. We perceive and grasp overall entities and structures only at the expense of precision and detail. Yet, this important observation has hardly emerged in the theoretical discourse of architecture. As architectural theorizing and teaching continues to be interested in focused vision, strong gestalt, conscious intentionality, and the perspectival understanding of space, I would argue that contemporary architecture is simply too hard-edged uh, too precise uh, for our uh, imagination and, and uh, perceptual mechanism to, to uh, uh, accommodate it in, in a uh, haptic manner. The historical rep uh, development of representational techniques of space are closely tied with the history of architecture itself. Representational techniques reveal the concurrent understanding of the essence of space and vice versa. Modes of spatial representation guide the understanding, understanding of spatial phenomena. It is evident that the human system of sensory perception <coughs> is a result of evolution, evolutionary processes and determined and limited by our fundamental primordial existential conditions. This comes back to what uh, Harry was saying about the biological ground, which I think is hugely uh, disregarded in uh, current thinking. And I hope that the next couple of decades will reveal the importance of the biological perspective. However, <clears throat> our intellect and imagination are capable of uh, engaging in conceptualized spatial characteristics beyond the scope of direct sensory perception. Scientific constructs of multidimensional space, for instance, that are impossible to be visualized, exemplify this extraordinary mental capacity. It is thought-provoking indeed that today's computer generating generated renderings of architecture appear as if they would take place in a valueless and homogeneous space, an abstracted mathematical 
and meaningless space rather than in existential and lived human reality. And this is exactly what renderings in emotionless mathematis mathematicized space are. The lived human condition is always an impure or dirty mixture of a score of irreconcilable ingredients. The lived world is beyond formal description because it is a multiplicity of perceptions and dreams, observations and desires, unconscious processes and conscious intentionalities, as well as aspects of past, present, and future. As the design process itself in today's computerized practice is in distance from this impurity of the flesh of the world, the very existential life force of architecture tends to be weakened or entirely lost. As Marshall McLuhan used to argue in the 1960s, the medium is the message, and this seems to hold true with the computer in the design world, design work, embodied experience of space. Since its invention in Renaissance time, the perspectival understanding of space has emphasized and strengthened the retinal architecture of vision. By the very definition, focused perspectival space turns us into outsiders and observers as it, as it pushes us outside the realm of the object of focused perception, whereas simultaneously and haptically perceived the referral space encloses and enfolds us in its embrace, making us insiders and participants. In the retinal understanding of space, we observe it, whereas acoustic, haptic, and olfactory spaces, as well as percepts of peripheral vision, constitute our shared and lived existential condition. These are also the sources of atmospheric experience or attunement, notions that have also been neglected by modern architectural <coughs> theory, but uh, are now emerging, as Harry pointed out. The world and the perceiver are not separated and polarized, as they are both ingredients of the shared existential flesh. The quest to liberate the eye from its perspectival fixation has gradually brought about conceptions of multi-perspectival simultaneous and haptic space. This is the perceptual and psychological essence of impressionist, cubist, and abstract expressionist painterly spaces that pull us into the painting and make, make us experience it as insiders in a fully embodied sensation. Visual space thus turns into an embodied, immersive, an existential space that is essentially a dialogue and exchange between the space and the world of the world and the internal space of the perceiver's mental world. The experience of interiority and belonging is merging is a merging of the outside and inside worlds. The evocation of the Welt innen Raum the interior experience of the world to use a beautiful notion of Rilke. The world is wholly inside and I am wholly outside myself, as Merleau-Ponty states somewhat enigmatically. This is the unique and personal existential space that we occupy in our lived experience. In the recognition of place, particularly that of one's home, the external world and the space become internalized. They are sensed as intrapersonal conditions rather than as external material objects, spaces, or percepts. 
the heightened presence and reality of profound artworks derive from the way they engage our perceptual and psychological mechanisms and articulate the boundary between the viewer's experience of self and the world. Works of art have two simultaneous existences. Their existence as material objects or as performance in music, theater, and dance, for instance, on the one hand, and as imaginative worlds of image and ideal on the other. The experiential reality of art is always an imaginative reality, and it is essentially a recreation by the viewer, listener, reader, occupant. This is the message of John Dewey's seminal book, Art as Experience of 1934. Lived reality always fuses observation, memory, and fantasy into a fused existential experience. As the consequence of this categoric impu impurity of experience, it is beyond objective scientific description and approachable only through poetic evocation. <coughs> This is the inner structural vagueness of human consciousness. Gaston Bachelard, as we know, was an authoritative philosopher of science until his mid-career when he came to the conclusion that only a poetic approach, not scientific inquiry and methodology, can touch upon the essence of lived human reality. In architecture, likewise, the difference between an architecture that invites us to a multisensory and full embodied experience on the one hand, and that of cold and distant visuality on the other, is equally clear. Uh, the works of Frank Lloyd Wright, Albert Alto, Louis Kahn, and more recently of Renzo Piano, Glenn Mercot, Stephen Hall, Peter Zuntor, Todd Williams and Billy Chien, and Rick Joy, among those of numerous other profound architecture around the world today, are examples of a multisensory architecture that pulls us into the space and reinforces our experience of ourselves and the sense of the real. These works root us in the complexities and mysteries of perception and the real world, instead of confining us in an alienating, constructed, and fabricated artificiality. As mentioned above, artistic phenomena take place simultaneously in two worlds, the realm of matter and that of mental Im imagery. In meaningful art, uh, architectural works, the Im imaginary world of architecture is rooted in the tectonic reality, materiality and processes of, of construction. Architecture articulates and expresses processes of construction and use. This narrative and logic of construction and utility also distinguishes architecture from other art forms such as installation art that also utilize space. Without the tension between the simultaneous material reality and its imaginary mental suggestion, an architectural work remains shallow and crude or sentimental. The dimming of vision and softening of boundaries. In heightened emotional states as listening to music or caressing our loved ones, we tend to eliminate the objectifying and distancing sense of vision altogether through closing our eyes. The spatial, formal and color integration in a painting is also often appreciated by dimming the sharpness of vision. The dynamic compositional totality can only be appreciated by suppressing detail. Maximum color inter uh, interaction in painting, in fact, 
calls for a weak formal gestalt that obscures the boundary of form, permitting thus an unrestricted interaction of the color fields across the boundaries. The interaction between figure and ground in visual perception stands in inverse proportion to the strength of the gestalt of the figure. The strong gestalt generates and maintains a strict perceptual boundary, whereas liberated gestalt-free perception weakens the structuring impact of boundaries, permitting thus form and color interaction across boundary lines and between ground and figure. The vagueness and softness of boundary has yet another meaning in creative thought and that concerns the experience of self. At the moment of creative fusion, even the artist architect's sense of self becomes momentarily fused with the world and with the object of the creative effort. In psychoanalytic literature, this experience is, uh, of sameness with the world is often called oceanic fusion or experience. Creative activity and deep thinking surely call for an unfocused, undifferentiated, and subconscious mode of vision which is fused with integrating tactile experiences and embodied <coughs> identification. The creative vision turns towards the inside, or in fact, it is directed outwards and inwards at the same time. Deep thought takes place in a transformed reality, a condition in which the existential priorities and alarms are momentarily forgotten. After a day of writing in my tiny summer studio by a lake, I could not always tell whether it has rained or not, although I have had my eyes directed to the surface of the lake all day long. The object of the creative act is not only identified and observed by the eye and touch, it is introjected, which is the psychoanalytic notion for the, how a ch child internalizes the world through his or her mouth, introjected, and identified with one's own body an existential condition. In deep thought, focused vision is blocked, and thoughts travel with an absent-minded gaze, accompanied by a momentary loss of a surface control of the existential situation. This is why deep thinking can usually take place only in the protective embrace of architecture in the cradle of the house, to use the notion of Gaston Bachelard, not in the unguarded outdoors. Bachelard points out that architecture allows one to dream in safety. When he writes, quote, the chief benefit of the house is that the house shelters daydreaming. The house protects the dreamer the house allows one to dream in peace." Unquote. My favorite working space at our country place is a room which is two meters wide, wide and two meters high and three meters deep. It's almost like an enlarged coffin. In that space, I feel my mind, uh, that my mind is intensely contained and my exist, uh, existential world is compressed. Photographed, the next chapter, the pool of vagueness, peripheral vision. Photographed architectural images are centralized and intentionally precise pictures of focused persons. Yet the uh, quality of lived architectural Reality depends fundamentally on the nature of peripheral vision and a deliberate suppression of sharpness that enfolds the subject in space. 
photographed imagery, particularly ones uh, taken with wide angle and deep focus, are alien to the natural faculties of vision. Consequently, there is an evident discrepancy between architecture as experienced through photographs and a real lived experience to the degree that imposing images of architecture in photographs often prove to be decisively less impressive when ex experienced live. The forest context, Japanese garden, richly molded architectural spaces as well as an ornamented and decorated interior provide ample stimuli for peripheral vision and these settings weave us as participants in the space and they center us in it in a haptic manner. As we move our position in the space even slightly, the unconscious, unconsciously and peripherally perceived details and distortions invigorate the experience of interiority like an unconscious haptic massage. Regardless of the object like externality and very strictly bounded nature of our focused gaze and the continuous flow of individual fragmentary images, we sense the continuity and completeness of space around us as an embrace. We even sense the space behind our backs. We live in worlds that surround us, not in frontal retinal images or mere perspectival pictures facing us. The innate spatiality of perception is reflected in the fact that our skin has maintained the surprising capacity to distinguish and identify light and color. We can easily learn to uh, distinguish colors through the pens of our legs and the pre-conscious perceptual realm, which is experienced outside the sphere of focused vision, is existentially as important as the focused image. We actually see twice. The first impulses go, uh, impulses go past our consciousness and inform the unconscious system, whereas we become only conscious of the second wave of stimuli that enters 30 milliseconds later. In fact, there is medical evidence that peripheral vision has a higher priority in our perceptual and mental system. Ehrenzweig offers the medical case of hemianopia as a proof for the priority of peripheral vision in the psychological hierarchy of our mechanism of sight. In the case of this rare illness, one half of the visual field turns blind while the other retains vision. In some, some cases, the field of vision reorganizes itself into a new complete circular field of vision with a new focus of sharp vision in the center and an unfocused field around. As the new focus is formed, the reorganization necessarily implies that parts of the former peripheral field of in inaccurate vision acquire visual acuity and more significantly, the area of former focused vision gives up, up its capacity for sharp vision as it transforms into, part, into a part of the new unfocused peripheral field. Quote, these case histories prove, if proof is needed, that an overwhelming psychological need exists that requi requires us to have the large part of the visual field in a vague medley of images. Unquote, Erin Zweig notes. Loss of specificity and sense of continuity. These observations on the existential significance of unfocused peripheral vision suggest that one of the reasons 
why the uh, architectural and urban settings of our time often project a weak sense of spatiality, interiority, and place in comparison with the stronger emotional engagement of historical and natural surroundings. It could be, the reason could be in the poverty of providing stimuli for perceptual, for peripheral perception. I venture to suggest that in our modern world, we live in a more focused world than was the case in earlier times. The fact that the human sensory world has dramatically changed through time has been convincingly argued in literature. This rather newly, in an evolutionary perspective, acquired precision could well have been supported by the central role of reading and pictures in our culture, as both call for focused and fixated eye. It is quite evident that the visual experiences of the world, uh, ex visual experience of the world has gained strength at the experience of auditory, haptic, and olfactory experiences. This is the mes message of Walter J. Ohm's significant book, Orality and Literacy. It is likely that at the same time, focused vision has begun to dominate over peripheral vision. The currently unchallenged hegemony of the eye may, in fact, be a fairly recent condition regardless of its philosophical grounding in Greek thought and optics. In Lucian Ferrer's view, quote, the 16th century did not see first, it heard and smelled, it sniffed the air and caught sounds. It was only later that, that it seriously and actively became engaged in geometry, focusing at attention on the world of forms. It was then that the vision was unleashed in the world of science as it was in the world of physical sensations and the world of beauty as well." End of quote. Unconscious peripheral perception transforms sharp and fragmentary retinal images into gestalt-free and vague spatial embodied <laughs> and haptic experiences that constitute our full existential and plastic experience and sense of continuum. We live in a plastic and continuous world due to our dynamic system of perception, awareness, memory and movements that keep uh, constructing a flowing entity out of discontinuous fragments. Peripheral vision integrates us with space, while focused vision makes us mere ocular observers. In physical training, our physical skills are deliberately maximized for the purposes of the specific skill for sport. But the mental processes of creative perception and thought are hardly directly touched upon in education. It is time to give vagueness and peripheral perception their role in our understanding of ourselves as well as in artistic and architectural thought and education. Thank you.